Thank you very much. Let's open our Bibles at this time to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6. 2 Thessalonians 1 6 for our message from God's Word this morning. If you're using the Pew Bible, 2 Thessalonians 1 6 will be found on page 1271. Page 1271. But in everyone's Bible, right after Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, then 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6. Raise your hand if you do not have the handout that says 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 6, and Ed will bring you one. Our people are well trained, though, aren't they? They seem to pick that up on the way in. And we're so thankful that Jeremy is adding the cross-references on the video screen as he tapes our messages. Well, today is September 27th, 2015, if you're joining us by video or by audio recording. Our text is going to be found in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6, 7, and we'll at least get into verse 8 a little bit. And the title of this morning's message is, There's a Bad Moon on the Rise. There's a Bad Moon on the Rise. How many of you are old enough to remember the Creedence Clearwater Revival song, Bad Moon Rising? Raise your hand, make me feel good. All right. The chorus of the song features that line, There's a bad moon on the rise. And I don't know if you know this or not, but that's a line that always appears in these collections that they make of misheard lyrics. You know what misheard lyrics are? <laughs> when Jimi Hendrix sang, excuse me while I kiss the sky, some people thought he said, excuse me while I kiss this guy. <laughs> well, when John Fogarty, the lead singer of Creedence Clearwater Revival, when he sang, there's a bad moon on the rise, some people thought he was singing, there's the bathroom on the right. <laughs> and they tell me that sometimes when John Fogarty is giving a concert, he sings it that way just to have fun. And I guess after you've sung the song for 50 years, you probably are looking for a little variety. <laughs> How many of you knew that when he wrote that song, he wrote it about the election of Richard Nixon in 1968? When he sang, I hope you've got your things together. I hope you're quite prepared to die. Looks like we're in for nasty weather. One eye is taken for an eye. That's a reference to how Nixon was viewed as an ultra-conservative that was not known for his mercy. But if you know your Bible, you know John was quoting your first cross-reference in Exodus 21, verses 24 and 25. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now, I don't have to tell you that God is often mocked and 
criticized for this brand of justice, isn't he? It's viewed as too harsh and, and too merciless. God is said to be unrighteous to implement that kind of law for mankind. But you know what? God Almighty has something to say about that <clears throat> in the opening verse of our text in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6 where I direct your attention at this time. <clears throat> in 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, Paul says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now first of all, that word recompense, that's not a word we use very often. But you tell me what the word recompense means when we compare our next two cross-references. Romans 12, 19, you know, it says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But look what Hebrews 10, 30 says. Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. Well, when we compare Scripture with Scripture, obviously the word recompense means what? Repay. To repay. And if you were here last Sunday, or if you know your Bible, you know that the Thessalonians were being troubled by some persecutors, by some troublemakers. So Paul says here in our text in verse 6, God plans to trouble those troublemakers with tribulation. And verse 6 says when he does so, it'll be a righteous thing. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. And trouble for troublemakers. And men can Complain all they want that God's not fair. But I ask you, what could be more fair than that? You knock out a man's tooth, you'll get your tooth knocked out. You trouble God's people, you get troubled. How is that not fair? You know... <laughs> You gotta love a God that lives by his own law, don't you? Our lawmakers oftentimes pass laws that they are exempt from. Did you know that? Let me give you an example. Did you know congressmen are exempt from the Freedom of Information Act? Did you know that? Did you know that congressmen don't have to post notices? of workers' rights, like you do if you own a business. You know, you've seen those signs posted in places of business. Did you know that congressmen can prosecute employees who report safety and health hazards in the workplace? That's against the law for you, not for congressmen. But that is not how God operates. God keeps the law that He gave to the people of Israel. He doesn't command men to be righteous without being righteous Himself. And after saying one eye should be taken for an eye, He vows to send tribulation on those who troubled the saints at Thessalonica. You read about it in your next reference in Revelation 13 and verse 10. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Anything unfair about that? Now, when Paul says that God's going to trouble the troublemakers with tribulation, He's not talking about just any tribulation. He's talking about the great tribulation 
that the Lord Jesus Christ talked about. You say, how do you know that? Well, let me ask you, what's going to come after the Great Tribulation? Isn't it the second coming of Christ? You know, the one that Paul talks about in the very next verse in your Bible, in verse 7. To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that's how you know that the tribulation that God planned to trouble the troublemakers with is the great tribulation. Because right after talking about the tribulation that he planned to trouble the troublemakers with, he goes on to describe the second coming that's going to follow the great tribulation. And God knows that in that great and terrible day, the day of the Lord, the tribulation period, more than any other time in human history, men are going to be saying, these judgments are not fair. Whatever we did, we don't deserve such severe judgments. And knowing that, knowing that men are going to be saying that more than at any time in history, the book of Revelation that describes the tribulation oftentimes says things like you read in your next cross-reference, Revelation 19 and verse 2. In Revelation 19, 2, it says, True and righteous are God's judgments. And you know what? If anybody gives him any lip about it in that day, he's going to be happy to defend himself and to explain how his judgments are righteous. For instance, in your next reference, Revelation 16, 3 to 6, the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, so thou hast given them blood to drink. Anything unfair about that? I don't think so. Folks, in the tribulation period, men are going to be saying that God's judgments are not fair. But angels are going to be saying that God's judgments are fair. Who do you think is right? <laughs> it's going to be the angels. Now, what does all this say about the doctrine of eternal punishment? You want to talk about a time when men are going to be saying God's judgment is not fair. I don't deserve to be in hell. God is unrighteous. Folks, that's going to be the theme song of hell for all eternity. But let me ask you a question about that. Throughout the Bible, God's judgments have always been fair and righteous and equitable. So how many of you think when it comes time to punishing the unsaved, God is going to suddenly decide to judge men with a judgment that is not fair? I mean, after living by that eye for an eye business, Throughout history, how many of you think when he sends men to hell, he's going to abandon that principle and give men a punishment that is not fair, that is unjust? If that's what you think, you don't know anything about the infinite holiness of God. 
Because a sin against an eternal God demands an eternal punishment. That's fair. Equal. That's what the word equitable means. And God would be unjust if He didn't give it to them. Now there's a dispensational aspect of verse 6 that we have to consider. You know, verse 6 sounds an awful lot like verses that we read in the Old Testament, like the one in your next reference in Isaiah 49.25. In Isaiah 49.25, Thus saith the Lord, I will contend with him that contendeth with thee. Now, if you're not sure who he's talking to there, do you remember what God told Abraham in your next reference? I know you know this verse. In Genesis 12, 1 to 3, the Lord had said to Abraham, I will curse him that curseth thee. Well, that helps helps you understand Isaiah, doesn't it? When Isaiah says God's going to contend with those that contend with thee, talking about contending with those that contend with the seed of Abraham, the Jews. So, the question is, why is Paul saying things like what Isaiah 49 said to us? Why is he saying that God is going to recompense tribulation to those that trouble the body of Christ instead of those that trouble the seed of Abraham? Well, here's the thing. (laughs) Paul says a lot of things like that. When Hosea says in your next reference in Hosea 13 and verse 14, God, this is God speaking, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. I got a question. Whose resurrection is Hosea talking about there? Well, before you answer, let's look at the context. The next reference has the context. Hosea 13, 9 to 14. O Israel, God says, I'll be thy king. I'll ransom them from the grave. Talk about the resurrection of Israel. So why does Paul quote Isaiah in your next reference when he's talking about our resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. Behold, I show you a mystery. Something Hosea knew nothing about. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Folks, that's just one of the ways that Paul uses the Old Testament. He applies the principles that applied to the people of Israel. Hey, I I don't care what dispensation it is. There is no sting in death for the believer. There is no victory for the grave. The victory is ours. And it doesn't matter what dispensation it is. You mess with God's people. You mess with Him. That's why Paul is saying back in your Bible now in verse 6, things like we read in Isaiah 49, that God will recompense tribulation to those that trouble members of the body of Christ. And i got to say, I'm sure that it comforted the Thessalonians to know that the ones that troubled them are going to be troubled in the tribulation. But as we read on now in your Bible, Paul has some more comfort for them. Look at verse 7 again. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. 
Now, I want you to notice something about that verse. That verse is not just a prediction. It's also an exhortation. You say, what what do you mean by that? Well, Paul doesn't say you will be resting with us when the Lord appears with his mighty angels to judge the world. Doesn't say that, does he? Now that's true. And the way Paul worded it, you could read it that way. As a prediction that when the Lord comes to judge the world, you'll be resting in heaven with the Apostle Paul. But the way he words it shows that it's not just a prediction, it's also an exhortation. When he says, and you who are troubled, rest with us, he's telling them they can rest with him now. Rest in the knowledge that they will be resting when the Lord comes in flaming fire. Listen, Paul was just as troubled by troublemakers as the Thessalonians. Didn't we see that in our scripture reading this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 11? If you weren't here for the scripture reading, if you're watching the video or listening by recording, read 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to the end of the chapter. Paul was whipped, beaten with rods, imprisoned, shipwrecked, stoned and starved and persecuted. But do you remember what he said about all those troubles in your next reference in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8? We are troubled on every side. Yet we're not distressed. You know what that means? That means Paul was more than willing to take it. He was more than willing to take the trouble that men were dishing out, knowing that he was going to be spared the trouble that the Lord's going to dish out when he shows up with flaming fire. And he's telling them they can feel the same way. Is there anything you can learn from that about your troubles? Feeling a little down lately maybe because of your problems? Feeling bad that you're troubled while the wicked all around us seem to be flourishing, seem to be trouble free, and the world is getting more wicked by the day. It can get discouraging. Until you remember, there's coming a day that the wicked are going to be troubled and you're going to be resting. And if you want to know just how much trouble they're going to get, notice that Paul says that when the Lord comes, He's going to have company. He's going to come with His mighty angels. And if you're wondering how, well, how, my, how mighty are the angels? Well, look at your next reference in 2 Kings 19, 35. The angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, four score, and five thousand, 185,000 men. They were all dead corpses. Now you look at that verse and who did that destruction? Someone called the angel of the Lord. And I know that sometimes in your Old Testament, that phrase, the angel of the Lord, is a theophany. You know what a theophany is? That's an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. A pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. Sometimes, but not all the time. Look at the cross reference in your next reference in 2 Chronicles 32, 21. A verse that's talking about the same event and it says the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of Assyria. It was just your average everyday run-of-the-mill angel. (laughs) But just one average everyday run-of-the-mill angel was able to slay 185,000 men and probably didn't even break a sweat. 
And you know how many angels the Lord's going to bring at the second coming? Did you notice looking back in your Bible now at verse 7 that it doesn't say that He's going to appear with some of His mighty angels. It says He'll appear with His mighty angels. Sounds like all of them to me. So now we have to ask, how many is all of them? Well, in Hebrews 12.22, your next reference, it refers to an innumerable company of angels. I don't know how many there are, folks, but you can't number them. You'd die before you got to the end, I guess. Folks, they're going to light up the sky like the 4th of July when He comes in flaming fire taking vengeance. And when He comes, we don't have to guess what mission He'll send the angels out to do. Because look, look at your next reference in Matthew 13.41. The Son of Man will send forth His angels and they'll gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Listen, when it talks about gathering out of the kingdom all things that offend Offending is what the troublemakers were doing to the Thessalonians. That's the Bible word for persecution. Look at your next reference. Matthew 18 and verse 6. Whoso, whoso shall offend one of these little ones. Now he was talking about the little children that came to him, but listen. What he said about them was just symbolic of the little children that followed him. Remember John, in the Gospel of John, the Lord will, he'd call, and, and in his epistles, he called them little children. Talking about the little flock, folks. And Matthew 18.6 says, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. You know what that means? That means that the troublemakers can't say they weren't warned. Yeah. Now, the raw, destructive power of His mighty angels is not the only heat that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be packing that day. Look at verse 8 in your Bible. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In addition to the awesome firepower of innumerable mighty angels, the Lord's going to be packing some heat all His own, and His weapon of choice is fire. Flaming fire. And you say, well, Pastor, how do you know that the fire isn't coming from the angels? By comparing Scripture with Scripture. Look at your next reference in Matthew 3, 1-11. In those days came John the Baptist, saying, I baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now I know everybody thinks that's talking about the same thing, you know, because the little cloven tongues of fire appeared on the saints at Pentecost when they were filled with the Spirit and baptized with the Spirit. It is not the same thing. The Lord Jesus Christ baptized people with the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. But people who rejected the Holy Ghost are going to be baptized with fire at the second coming of Christ. And they can't say that God didn't warn them. Because John said the fire's coming. And the Lord's going to bring it. And if you're still not convinced of that, look at your next reference in Psalm 21, 8 and 9. Speaking to God, the psalmist says in Psalm 21, 8 and 9, Thine enemies, thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath. The fire shall devour them. Psalm 50 and verse 3, your next reference. Our God shall come and a fire shall devour before Him. Now maybe you can't picture that and you say, well, where's this fire going to come from? 
Now look at Isaiah 30 and verse 33. For Tophet is ordained of old. The pile thereof is fire and much wood and the breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. Well, you want to talk about morning breath. (laughs) Maybe you're thinking, my breath isn't fiery. I can't breathe fire. Yeah, but you know what you can do? On a cold winter day, you can... (sighs) Isn't that interesting? Even a mortal like you can breathe heat. Is it so hard to believe the Son of God could breathe fire? If it is, take a look at your next reference in Revelation 11, 3-5, where God talks about my two witnesses. Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt these two witnesses, he must in this manner be killed. So, it's not hard to believe that at the second coming of Christ, the Lord will slay His enemies with fire. Look at your next reference in Isaiah 11, verse 4. He shall smite the earth with the rod of His mouth, And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now, maybe all this time you've been thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, I thought the book of Revelation says that he's going to use a sword proceeding out of his mouth to slay the wicked. And that's true. Look at your next reference. Revelation 19, 11 to 15. John sees these visions and he says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him in righteousness. Over and over again in the book of Revelation, God makes sure people understand when He judges, it's in righteousness. In righteousness He doth judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven followed Him. Those are the angels, the innumerable company of angels. And out of His mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And you know what sword he was talking about if you know your next reference in Revelation 1.16. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Does that make you think of your next reference in Hebrews 4.12? The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So at the second coming of Christ, the, the sword coming out of the Lord's mouth is the word of God. And they're not going to be able to say they weren't warned because what does it say in your next reference in Revelation 2.16? Repent or else I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. But will a sword come out of the Lord's mouth or will fire? The answer is yes. Look at your next reference if you don't know what I'm talking about. Jeremiah 23:29 God says Is not my word like as the fire saith the Lord The fiery breath of the Lord is going to slay the wicked And the breath is his word What makes words Isn't it when your breath just passes by your vocal cords right What makes your breath hot? It's breath passing by the vocal cords. Imagine the breath of God. And once again, men are not going to be able to say that God didn't warn them. Look at your next reference. In Jeremiah 5.14, God said to Jeremiah, He says, I'll make my words in thy mouth fire! And this people would, and it'll devour them. He says, Jeremiah, you go out and warn these people. And my word will be like a fire of warning. If they received Jeremiah's words, they'd get saved. If they didn't receive his words, his words would devour them, it says. 
and then they'd get the fire of the Lord's mouth at the second coming. Look at what Malachi says in 4.1. Malachi 4.1, Behold, the day cometh that'll burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be like stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. Back in your Bible now, he says in flaming fire, notice, taking vengeance. When you think of vengeance, do you think of somebody who's hot? Do you think of fiery kind of things? Like fiery kind of anger? I do. And that agrees with your next reference in Deuteronomy 32, 35 and 41. Where God says, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. I will render vengeance to my enemies. And you don't have to wonder who it is he's going to avenge because I gave you a verse right two verses later in Deuteronomy 32.43. He will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. Just like you're seeing here. He's going to recompense tribulation to those that trouble his servants. And listen... I don't have to tell you, the wicked have been troubling God's people since the dawn of time. And with that in mind, if you don't think that the Lord's in a hurry to avenge every one of those martyrs, you don't know much about how He feels about His martyrs. But you know who else hope that he hurries to bring that vengeance. Let's do a little heavenly eavesdropping in your next reference. In Revelation 6, 9, and 10, John says, I saw the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and they cried, How long, O Lord, dost thou not avenge our blood? They're in a hurry for him to take vengeance. And I want you to think about what you just read in that verse. That means that right now, the Old Testament martyrs from Abel on through to moments ago are crying out for vengeance. And the Lord Jesus Christ has been listening to them cry for vengeance every day for 2,000 years. And what do we know about the Lord's days in your last reference in 2 Peter 3.8? One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Every day that he has to hear these martyrs cry for vengeance seems like a thousand years. Does that give you any idea of the grace that the Lord Jesus Christ is showing every day? We're going to talk more about verse 8 next week. I only go as far as the cross-reference sheet will let us go. Because I think what God has to say to you is more important than what I have to say. But if you're not saved this morning, the great tribulation is coming. And the Lord Jesus said it's going to be the worst time in human history. It's going to make the Holocaust look like a picnic. If you're not saved, maybe you've been warned about hell. But you can't relate to this mystical place outside of planet earth where the torment never ends. But you can relate to a hundred pound hailstones coming down like the book of Revelation says they'll come in the tribulation. You can relate to things like the fresh water supply being turned into blood like the book of Revelation says in the tribulation. You can relate to not being able to buy food or medicine without the mark of the beast, as will be the case in the tribulation. 
That day is coming. And when it comes, you're not going to be able to say, it's not fair. And you're not going to be able to say, nobody warned us. We saw warning after warning this morning. And most of all, you're not going to be able to say, God didn't send His Son to die and pay for my sins so that I don't have to be judged by these judgments or an eternity in the lake of fire. You're not going to be able to say that no one ever told you that all you have to do to be safe from all that is to believe that God sent His Son to pay for your sins. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this passage of Scripture. We all tend to get discouraged when every day the news brings more reports of the erosion of morality in this country and in the world. More things that go against what you have outlined in your word. It can get downright discouraging. And then when we hear about the oppression going on in some areas and that's coming, seems to be coming here, Lord, it just warms our hearts, frankly, to know that the day is coming when you'll not just judge the wicked, but that you'll make everything right and set up a kingdom that will honor thee and kingdom wherein righteousness will rule and reign. We're thankful for our blessed hope, the subject of Second Thessalonians, that we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a bright, what a bright prospect. We pray that it might come soon. We pray it in His name. Amen.